I'm just hoping there is no disciplinary email or something. Say, you have been fired. <laughs> All right, and I think we can, I can see the screen. I don't know about the other colleagues. Uh, and please, as before we start, maybe you can tell us your preference on whether you'd want people to ask to ask questions to interrupt you, or if you'd prefer for for them to ask questions towards the end. Um, uh, I normally prefer towards the end myself, but it's up to you. Thank you. Um, I don't mind either. So if you feel like asking while we are while we are interacting, I'm still okay with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, so good afternoon, everyone. And uh, as Lighton said, I basically would just like to share our experiences at Zikas as regards the uh, implementation of of our institutional repository. So I thought before we start, we could uh, actually, I thought we could have an understanding of, of what an academic library is so that we, we, we appreciate where the idea of, of a repository is coming from. So basically, an academic library is one which is attached to a higher learning of institution and the whole purpose is to support the curriculum and the research of the university faculty and students at large. So we all know that we are in a changing world and the dynamics in education and educational provision have changed. And as information specialists or as librarians, we also need to step up and have library services that provide um, the needs or meet the various needs of his clientele minus the restriction of time and space. And one way in which this can be achieved is to have a digital library. And uh, one may ask what a digital library is. We know that it's a database of digital objects that can include a lot of things like text, still images, audio, video, digital documents, or other digital formats. And the typical example of a digital library, there are a lot of examples, but obviously I chose the institutional repository as one of the examples of a digital library. We might want a definition, and so I thought we could just have a brief definition of an, an institutional repository. And in our case, it's an archive for collecting, preserving, and disseminating digital objects of intellectual output of an institution. And in this case, a research institution or, um, or a university. And why should we have an uh, institutional repository? So in our case at Zikas, we wanted to have an institutional repository so that we can be able to manage, preserve, and maintain the digital assets, intellectual output, and histories of uh, on the history of our institution. And this can apply across the board for academic institutions or for any other library that might want to have an institutional repository. Another reason, obviously, would be to create global visibility for an institution's scholarly research. We want as much as possible to share the institution's scholarly research findings with the world. And one way we thought this can happen is to have an institutional repository. So I'm going to talk about the implementation process of the institutional repository at Zika's. We basically began working towards establishment of uh, an institutional repository in March 2019. Um, though it's not indicated here, I must mention that uh, we had a, a brief training or yeah, a brief workshop as regards institutional repositories where we were taught and how to go about the same. And after that training, we began our discussions with the IT department because currently our library does not have uh, a specified or a dedicated IT personnel. So we work hand in hand with our IT department to come up with the idea of the institutional repository. So after our discussions, we went on to set up the platform 
and uh, during setup we did trial uploads here and there and after a number of uploads that is uploads of student dissertations and thesis we launched the repository to the internal community of Zikas, and that is the faculty and other members of staff and since we launched it we made it and after the launch we made it live and um, I must apologize that right now it's going through maintenance but I'm going to share uh, a screen as how as regards how a repository looks like when you just log in and since then we have been continuously trying to upload our student thesis as well as our faculty's uh, journal research articles and the like. So during the process of our implementation, there are a lot of lessons that we learned and uh, I must say this is still work in progress for us, but as we have been going on, there's been a lot of lessons that we've learned and uh, would like to share those lessons and if there's anyone who's uh, thinking of beginning a, re a repository these lessons would be a good starting point to to uh, to to implement an, an institutional repository so i think the starting point would be having a cpd as regards sensitizing the members of on what an, an institutional repository is and what is required for its smooth operation. Because um, in our case, I noticed that not every one of us was really conversant with, uh, with the processes and not everyone was really conversant with uh, what needs to be done. So having a CPD or maybe frequent sessions with the people involved as what is required ab about an institutional repository. So this CPD could involve the library staff, it could also involve the lecturers or the faculty themselves because they also need to understand what needs to be done on their part as they send in documents to the repository. So another thing that we learned is that there's need to have an ingestion policy as well as guidelines. So this was going to serve as a standard operating procedure which describes the process, which describes the procedure and guidelines for ingestion of publications. So publications could be conference papers, could be uh, student ETDs, it could be journal articles. So any form of publication that you might wish to ingest or upload in the repository, we felt that there was need to have an ingestion policy and guidelines. And that is what we are currently working towards. Uh, we are currently working towards having this policy. And the thinking behind is, if today we leave Zika's, the people that will come behind after us will find this document in black and white and they might not have to struggle or they might not have to start from one to ingest or go about running the repository. So basically another objective for the policy is to ensure that the submitted publications are eligible for ingestion. And the other um, objective is to make sure that uh, the profile of Zika's university research output is raised and made visible and accessible. What do I mean by making sure that uh, publications are eligible for ingestion into the repository? There are factors that you need to consider as whether this is an original work of someone, whether you are not violating any policy agreements or, uh, or embargoes. So there's need to make sure that whatever you are going to put out there for everyone to see is eligible and does not put the institution in dispute. Another lesson we learned while implementing our repository, we, say, we thought for journal articles, 
authored by Zika staff but not published by the Zika University. Copyright guidelines for the publisher shall apply. So our experience was or has been we have a lot of articles that are, have been authored by our faculty but these articles are actually not published by Zika's University. They are published by other journals out there. And so our beginning point was we were just uploading those without actually understanding or reading through the copy, copyright guidelines for the original publishers who are the journal who are the journals of uh, the articles where the the, the faculty would publish in. So after we realized that we, ca we came up with a policy and that this is also appearing in our policy to say the copyright guidelines for the publisher shall apply. So if the uh, publisher allows or permits that we share as open access, we would share via our repository. If those publishers do not um, allow, we obviously would not share. And that was the experience. We had to pull out some of the journals we had put because of those copyright restrictions. We also had uh, instances where the journals, where the articles are appearing, would allow to share via our repository on condition that we acknowledge the original source of that um, publication. And so what we have done is just put a, a link of that journal together with the hand, we put a URL for that journal as a additional metadata or, or handle. And that enables, or rather that protects the institution as not violating the copyright. We also learned that there's need to be clear on which collections to deposit what journal or what publication or which publication. Um, institutional structures, institutional repository structures vary according to institutional needs. So it is very important to clearly state which collection and co community should house the various university publication. So a classic example, I think the UNSA repository, being a student at UNSA, I've had to interact with the UNSA repository. The structures mostly is in schools and schools, I think are then later subdivided into departments. For Zika's, we, um, a, we are we are we are literally just growing, and we have about three or three schools currently running. So, what we have on our repository, we have structured it according to schools. That is the school of business. We have the school of uh, social sciences and the school of uh, information communication technology. So, in those schools. We also have communities, which is uh, journal articles, and uh, we also have a community for thesis and dissertations. So for journal article community, this is where we put articles by faculty of that particular school. For the thesis and dissertations, this is where we upload uh, thesis and dissertations by our students in the particular schools. We also noted that it is important to be clear as regards metadata and which metadata scheme to use. So DSpace, which is a platform on which uh, our institutional repository is sitting, is using the Dublin core as a default. And so we decided to actually just adopt that. And for clarity's sake, this appears also in our ingestion policy. And like I said, this is just to guide people and act as a, a roadmap to show whoever would come after us 
or a new person who might come to show or to guide them on how to go about it. And really the main reason for this is to ensure uniformity in how the, the, the information is, um, is broadcast out there. So we have the contributing author, if it's for, uh, this applies to, to both the thesis and dissertation as well as the journal articles. We have all these other things that appear on the screen. And we thought it is very important to clearly state and it acts as a guideline. So if I'm new and I'm ingesting content with such a guideline, I can be able to quickly note where or what I've left out. So like I said, the table shows the Dublin Core Metadata Scheme and it's used as the default encoding scheme during the ingestion of digital repositories in our repository. We also learned that uh, there's need to use controlled vocabularies. And so we know that uh, controlled vocabulary is a selected list of words or phrases basically used to tag units of information. And the whole reason is to increase retrieval. So another one would say controlled vocabulary is a standardized group of words and it provides terminology to catalog and uh, retrieve information. So basically, if we do have controlled uh, vocabularies, it makes life easy as um, regards when someone is searching out there, it, it increases the, the, the chances or it increases retrieval at the end of the day. One other lesson we learned is that um, there was no consistency in, in, in ingesting names of authors. I'll give a classic example where you have, uh, for instance, a doctor who has authored um, an article. That same doctor authors a different article and you have two people ingesting those articles. So our experience was um, you'd find that in one, they're appearing as doctor. In another, they're just appearing as a mister or missus or miss. So when it comes to searching and uh, in terms of uniformity and probably just uh, having a clean outlook, it was a bit difficult to even keep track of who does what. This is very easy for us who are probably employees of Zikas. You can know that probably Dr. Kayonfo is a, is a member of Zika's. But if someone is searching out there and they want to search for a particular author, Mr. Kayombo and Dr. Kayombo would be totally two different people. So we thought we should put it as policy to have this, to have some consistency in as regards the version of names for authors. And basically, it's easy identification and tracking of authors. And in institutions of learning, obviously, sometimes there's grading that happens for faculty based on the number of research or the amount of research you have done. And so if this is done by an external person, it might be a bit difficult to, to know who a Mr. Kayombo is or a Dr. Kayombo is. So we decided, or rather we thought it would be good to put it as policy to stick to the same version of names for this reason. Another lesson we learned in our, in our work or in our implementation, you would find that because of having different people ingesting content at different times, there wasn't uniformity in writing. Sometimes you would find a time. Sorry, excuse me. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm sure you don't mind being interrupted. No, um, no, no. When you were talking about uh, Mr. Kayombo and uh, Dr. Kayombo, mm -hmm. I've, I've just said you decided as policy to do something, but I'm not clear on um, what you have done about that. Okay. So what okay. we have. So what we have. 
Thank you. Okay. So, so what we uh, have actually done is uh, we have decided that for people with PhD, we all we include the doctor title at the uh, when ingesting. For everyone else, like we do, just for authors, we do not include the Mister, Mrs., Miss title. Um. um okay. So so. So what what happens with the documents they did before doctor? Are they still put in the same category? Or, or yeah, I think. Or what happens to someone who, after today, they become a doctor? Are you then going to move all their 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 documents to that, or what are you going to do? I think we'll do that because at the end of the day, the of we just day, want this for easy identification, identification among ourselves and, uh, and uh, out there. You know, uh, okay, I'm not saying it should change, but um, I was thinking that for the sake of avoiding the confusion altogether, isn't it just enough to... To, to do it the way we do with authors, it's just the surname and the first name or initials without bothering with the title. Mm, we'll put that in consideration. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry, where am I speak? Who is this? Stundu. Stundu oh. from Camila. <laughs> oh, noted. So we'll put that in consideration. Okay, thank you. Noted. Noted. <laughs> Um, so we were talking about writing style, and uh, we said our experience was you find that some people would, would ingest content in cups as in upper casing, others would put content the normal way we write. And uh, we felt this was really also distorting, or rather, this didn't look very neat on our end. And so we thought we put it also as policy or, or as guideline that no more writing shall apply when ingesting content. Only in cases where it is important to use upper casing shall it be used. So our Zika students have a, a writing style which is provided for, for ETDs. So we encourage that even as we are ingesting content in our repository, those should be followed. And uh, as a, an officer or as a librarian or a library or personnel who's ingesting content, they must make sure that the provided guidelines are followed based on the various schools because the other two schools have the same one, the School of Law, has a different format. So to maintain uniformity, we thought this should also come out in our, in our guidelines. One of the lessons learned also is uh, most of the articles or the, the content that we have on our repository was not indexed on Google Scholar. So it is work in progress on our end. would like to have most of our faculty's research output indexed on Google Scholar for increased visibility. And also just a note that the policy should exist to ensure conformity to set out guidelines and ensure uniformity. Um, this is where I end, thank you. Unless there are questions, Dr. Perry. Oh, yeah. uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Dubeka. Right? That was really nice. Now, uh, I, I, I happen to have a bit of uh, insight in terms of yeah. what, what our colleagues from Zikas have been doing. In fact, not too long ago, they invited us, myself and uh, a colleague of mine, Abel and uh, Zachary. Mm -hmm. uh, they invited us to a very nice event. They fed us, actually, which was quite nice. So um, I, uh, I, I don't have any specific questions myself. I'll leave it up to the people in the audience to to share their thoughts or to ask questions. But I just wanted to point out that some of the things that um, um, 
that Bumba was talking about um, are probably going to come up again on Wednesday when we have um, the current acting institutional repository manager for the University of Zambia Library, Zachary. Um, and I, I, I do believe he's going to touch a little bit on policy, but his focus is going to be on how you get to market your IR, right? So uh, issues that uh, Bumba was talking about with regards to indexing content uh, so that when people search for Scholarly research output on platforms such as Google Scholar, your scholarly publications appear there, right? Uh, and then also uh, on Thursday, there's another talk by Abel, which is more aligned towards open access publishing, but you probably want to attend because these things are linked. But so I'll uh, invite questions if people have any specific questions for uh, Boomba. I know I see people in the house that perhaps might be interested in implementing or launching IR. So I guess now would be the time to ask questions so that you learn a thing or two. Feel free to ask if you have a question. It's uh, open season. <laughs>